which is Dr. Fola Babalola. But before I introduce him to take up this um, webinar, to take up this talk, I would like to read his biography, his, uh, biography for you. Dr. Fola Babalola holds PhD in forest economics, obtained from University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He's currently a senior lecturer and researcher in the Department of Forest Resource Management, University of Illorin. His field of specialization is forest social economics with research focus on interdependence of forest and people and how this affects livelihood. So Dr. Babalola has been working with people for quite some time now. Dr. Babalola is a senior consultant to Food and Agriculture of United Nations on small-scale forest enterprises in Africa, and he has traveled wide. He was awarded Vice Chancellor Postdoctoral Fellow and currently a visiting lecturer at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. He has supervised a number of master's and doctoral students, aside more than 40 undergraduate students in which he has supervised and graduated. He has published a book and more than 100 research articles in journals and conference proceedings. Also, his personal and team research have won various international research grants and awards with fellowships and travel trips to attend scientific gatherings. He has facilitated various capacity building programs for conservation professionals and led organization of workshops and conferences within and outside Nigeria. With passion to apply his research and experience in solving environmental challenges, Dr. Babola founded this great NGO called Save Sahara Network, with focus of saving of nature and connecting nature to people. So I would like to welcome Dr. Fola Babalola for this webinar. Dr. Fola, you can take over, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, Bidemi, for that introduction. It's always very good for you to listen and hear people read your uh, citation. Uh, celebrating environment is a day that I count very important for us to observe to deliberate and to discuss what environment is facing and what we need to do as human, what we need to do as people who are the beneficiary of these ecosystem services provided by the environment. So today, according to United Nations, I tie to this webinar, biodiversity and connection to human. As rightly mentioned, I am Fola Babalola, a researcher and a lecturer, and also an NGO uh, stakeholder. Now let us kickstart my presentation. In short, this is what I'm going to quickly give us today. What is biodiversity? What are those issues? And what are the drivers of biodiversity laws that we are facing right now that we want to challenge? Also, how can we play our roles? How can we play our part as stakeholders in biodiversity conservation? So these three I'm going to quickly cover within the limited time that I have. Now, 2020 World Environment Day, as I earlier mentioned, was started by United Nations Environmental Program and Every 5th of June, every year, has been dedicated to World Environment Day. This 2020, we are focusing on biodiversity. And the theme is, is time for nature. Why is it time for nature? What is the meaning of this theme that we are choosing for this year? Simply put, one million plant and animal species around the world risk process of going to extinction and likely is due to human beings. We are the one consuming this and we are the one that is endangering their lives. So this issue demands even our intention, despite the fact that we are undergoing COVID-19 issue. We still need to focus on biodiversity because we can't do without it. Therefore, we have a call to action to combat all these accelerating factors causing biodiversity loss, species loss, 
and all those factors causing degradation to our environment. We need to make a call to action for every one of us. Now, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is formed from two key words, biological and diversity. And if I just want quickly to say, because I don't want to get off board with so many big definitions, but biodiversity simply means plant and animal. And even all those living things that we cannot see with our naked eye, they also constitute biodiversity, like fungi, bacteria. If you want to look at this biodiversity, how do we, why does it really matter? Why does biodiversity matter at this time that we, that we command our attention? It's because the health of human being is connected with biodiversity. If we must have good health, the environment must have good health. Biodiversity must be in good condition. Why? It sustain our life. Without them, we are dead. Because they provide us with clean air that we breathe in. They provide us with even water that we drink. They purify this water for us. They ensure that there is availability of food, good and nutritious food that we eat. Without all this biological diversity, there's no food for us. They also make sure that we have medicine. Look at medicine, raw material for our industry. We can see how valuable and how important biodiversity is to us. Without them, we are nobody. But with the issue that we are undergoing right now, how can we really know that biodiversity is under threat? Biodiversity has been undergoing disbalance from the natural status they have always been many, many years ago. And some of the pointer to this fact that biodiversity is under threat include the following. Number one, we have bushfire going on around the world. This, the intensity of bushfire is increasing on daily basis. And this is a pointer to us that something is wrong. Also, we had about this locust invasion in the Horn of Africa. This is telling us there's something going on. Also, we have this issue of even pandemic we are shouting now, the COVID. Something is wrong for making this COVID to come into existence all of a sudden, and people are dying. This means something is wrong. But even despite of all these facts that we have, I have two news for us. There's a sad news and there's a good news. The sad news is that we are fast losing bio biological diversity. We are fast losing our plants. We are fast losing our animal. And they are going to the point of extinction. But the good news is this thing can be reversed because they are called renewable natural resources. They can be reversed. And now that is why we are calling our attention that we need to take action in order to reverse all this anthropogenic factor we have introduced to the balance of natural resources. And now, even if I now tell you what are the major causes of this loss that we are facing right now, something caused them, something caused the disbalance in the nature. And the first thing is the way we use land. Land use change. We have changed the way we use land over the years. We have changed the way we demand for land and the way we demand for food, the way we demand for resources is making our land to change. These things are driving biodiversity laws through deforestation, destroying of natural habitats across the globe. Number two, we have overexploitation of plants and animals. If we have overexploitation of all these resources, something is wrong because it's going to lead to destruction. And number three is climate change. The climate is changing. Every climate, we, now we are experiencing global warming. We're experiencing excessive flood, excessive rainfall, and inappropriate of this thing at the particular point in time. So this is a point out to all that we are fast losing biodiversity, who is balancing this in nature. Another one is pollution. The rate by which we release different pollution, the gas, the solid, and even the liquid into the environment is caused is a threat to biodiversity loss. And lastly, invasive alien species. Because people move from one country to the other, you tend to carry along with you plant and animal that are alien, that are not indigenous to a local area. This is leading to alien encroachment, invasive species in our indigenous communities. 
So these are some of the factors that leads to biodiversity loss. Now, let me quickly go to the main point of the day. And the main point for today is how can we play our roles? What are the things that we need to do? Different stakeholders within this country and around the world, we need to play our role in preventing biodiversity law. And I'll quickly pick some of those stakeholders that need to play their role in biodiversity loss, uh, in preventing biodiversity loss. Number one, individual. As individual, you and I, we have a role to play in ending biodiversity loss. We have a role to play in preserving nature for human beings. And how can we play our role? These are the ones that I quickly mentioned here. Number one, if you want to prevent biodiversity loss and we want to bring back biodiversity, why can't we start having garden in our homes? It is not everywhere that we have interlock. It's not everywhere that we concrete our floor. As individuals, let us plan to have garden in our balcony. Let's plan garden in our backyard by bringing back biological diversity. If you have garden in your homes, bird will come. And some little animals that are supposed to not to have habitat again, they will come back. Another one is to initiate or get involved on community green initiatives. We have some green initiatives going on right now around the world. If there's no one going on around your area, you can form one and ask people to participate on individual level. Let us avoid buying single-use plastics. Now, plastic is a very big problem and challenge to us to the ocean, to the environment, to the dumping ground. These things are non-biodegradable. Even if we want to use plastic, let us renew it. Let us continue to reuse it, not disposing it every time. Now, let us recycle what we use. Let us minimize use of household chemicals that have toxic impact on our soil or even on the groundwater. Let us create a composite, compost of even for our garden. If we want to do garden, we can develop our organic manure, not fertilizer to, to, as nutrient to our, for our plants. Now let us explore how to buy locally produced products. Not everything must be imported. And lastly, let us cons conserve the way we consume energy because this thing costs environment too in production. Now, second, the second stakeholder I want to talk about, they are the faith leaders and faith group. These are the religious people. We know Nigeria, we are religious people. We know God, we worship God. In every home, you see people that are one way or the other linked to either Christianity or Islam. We need to play our role too as religious leader. And how can we play our role? Let our faith leaders inspire their worshiper to live in harmony with the earth, with nature. If we have sermons coming from our pulpit, telling people on how to prevent and to conserve degradation in our environment, they will listen and they will act. Let our faith leader initiate the cons and accept invitation to speak at places they can uh, uh, introduce this, our message to. Even we that are researchers, let us go to churches, let's go to mosques to speak to people in this area. And another one is that we should lead an online religious sermon. When we have private, we can start sending private information, private chats to people relating the scripture in our holy book that talks about prevention of uh, preventing biodiversity and uh, loss. We have a lot of this scripture in our holy book that we can quote in support of what? Of environmental uh, protection. Let us share faith passages, even on environmental protection to people. Let us encourage tree planting, even around our faith. Let us make sure that we give people even space to go and Oh my God. Now, another set of people that I want to mention here, they are the, they are the Business owners. Business owners too have their role to play. As business owner, we can involve in biodiversity protection or conservation. By one, we should try to look at how we produce, how we distribute, how we consume, 
And now we dispose resources in our production. Optimize resources. Let us minimize greenhouse gas emissions. And let us avoid harmful chemicals that cause biodiversity in our environment. Now, another one is as a business person, let us source our product locally. By the time we source our product locally, it's going to prevent greenhouse emission through transportation. Let us also invest in research and development that leads to what climate smart technology for our businesses. This will help us a lot as we tackle environmental challenges. And let us be very efficient in our energy consumption, even in the production. By the time we are efficient, we are going to reduce impact on the environment. Cities is the next one. Not only people in the rural area can actually conserve biodiversity. Even those of us in the city, we have a role to play. Because according to United Nations, it says that by the year 2050, about 80% of the world will be living in urban areas. If 80% of the total population of, let's say, 200 million are living in, in urban area, this is a very serious issue. And so we, our government or those estate agents, people in charge, must make sure that they set target to protect and create green spaces in our city. Let us create parks. Let us create places where people can play. Let us plant trees along our street. Let us plant trees in government-owned spaces. We are going to do what? Conserve those biological diversity that we remove during the process of work structural development. Now, let us introduce watershed even along our water courses in urban areas and in cities. And let us allocate fund as government or the estate agent allocate fund for biodiversity protection. This is very important for us in the city in order to take action in preventing or restoring biodiversity. Now, this is an example of a city we can see how this green city is. Now, what are the different ways by which we can restore vegetation loss in our cities? Number one, we can actually practice what we call urban forest. Urban forest is a planting of trees in our urban area. Collection of trees that are there, they have very important role to play in our area. We can include green spaces. These spaces are places where people can actually play, like playground, public gardens, these are places we can plant with trees, grassy straws that we can use as picnic and we can use to gather ourselves together and we can have fun. As we're having fun, we are directly leading to what? Removal of oxygen, uh, removal of carbon dioxide and increasing oxygen buildup in our area. Also, we can do urban greening. In urban greening is a, like a landscaping our open or public spaces with grasses and green uh, plants. Also, we can have green building. Green building is what is in vogue now. With green building is a process whereby we conform our building, our houses to something that will be environmental friendly, that will reduce or eliminate negative impact. It can also create a positive impact on our environment. Building that we have reduction in energy consumption Building that we have reduction in pollution uh, released into the environment. Those are some of the things that we can do to our building and make it green building. So this is an example of a green building, but because of time, we can see a lot of input that are put there to make it uh, green. And now there are some features that we can that can make our building green. If you want your house to be green, make sure that you use efficient energy there and Efficient energy in form of our light consumption, water consumption, and other resources. Let's make sure that we have renewable energy in our home. Now, people are using solar energy. It's not every time we use our generators. Let's make sure that pollution and weight reductions are being carried out in our house. Then you are going green. There's good indoor environmental air quality. If you, pre if you have good crossing of air into your homes, Without putting on a fan and air conditioning every time, your home, your home or your house is becoming green compliance. 
you have to use some non-toxic material in the building of your houses. And you must consider even the environment in the design of your building. So green buildings start from even construction and from, from the design to construction and operation. So these are some of the things that can make our house green. And this is an example of green building I'm talking about. We can see some of these houses. This is current revolution. This is where innovation is taking buildings to. We can have all this green material in our house. And another one is rooftop. People now plant gardens on top of their roof. They have green grasses on top of their roofs, making the house cool and preventing a heat that will increase our electric consumption through air condition or fan. Now, these are the examples uh, about some of the benefits of green tops. Because of time, let me move forward. And if you see this quote, I really love this quote. This quote is telling us that if we should plant, we, we, we need to plant even fruit bearing a uh, tree bearing fruit in our street and in our environment, not only ornamental crops, but if you have something like this, it's going to save us a lot of uh, stress, it's going to improve our biodiversity, it's going to give us oxygen and again the nutrition to our body. Now let's go to the government. Government need a role to play. Those of us in government, our policy makers, they have a role to play in this fight that we are talking about. And how can they play their role? Number one, they need to put biodiversity conservation at the heart of their decision-making process. They need to make sure that even in our national agenda, we have biodiversity conservation. We need to invest in renewable energy in our country. Even as we are moving towards energy production, let us explore renewable energy. Let us review all this outdated policy that we are using on our biodiversity protection. They are long outdated. All those ones that we built during colonial era, let's review them. Then we have then we have just started fighting. Let fund be provided. When we are talking about diversity protection or conservation, it costs money. We want to plead that our government provide money. Policy maker, let us provide money. And let us put in place pleasure, uh, measures to make sure that we protect our forests, our national parks, game reserves, forest reserves. Let them be put into very good, uh, Let's put a pretty good measure in order to protect all these uh, our resources. Now, schools and teachers. In our schools, starting from primary to secondary, even up to university, we have roles to play. Because at these centers, at this area, is where we build the mindset of our youth. This is where we build the mindset of people. So, how can our school? play their role, how can school play their own part? They need to host tree planting event. We need tree planting event in our school so that our youth will cultivate this culture of tree planting because we are fast losing the culture of tree planting. And in doing that, we will make sure that their future is secure and they can go into the future with the mindset of having trees around them. They need to create opportunity for even young people to engage in nature-based activities. In our school, let us have nature clubs, environmental clubs, outdoors activities that we create a mindset of nature in our youth. Our curriculum, curriculum needed to be improved to include all these things we are talking about. Now, as Safe Sahara Network, we are doing our own bit. Even there's something we call Green School Initiatives, a program we are doing currently that we are using to create awareness in schools, that we are using to bring back the lost vegetation due to urbanization process in our schools. So we train students and we engage students and teachers in tree planting. So look at an area that we just, we observe in my own region of the country, which is the Sahara part of Nigeria. This is Savannah part of Nigeria. And we have a grand like this. This is a school without single vegetation. So we pick up this challenge by start planting trees. We engage students. These are some of the schools. See that some of the students we engage in planting trees. And this is another training and capacity building program we organize for students, especially in observing birds around them. And these are teachers we engage in planting trees. Teachers too are not left out. They all engage in our tree planting. And again, these are students. And you can see the example of where we planted trees in some of the schools. 
this is a very great challenge for us because as we are planting the trees, we have things to contend with, animals to contend with. And that is why we have to guard it by putting nets. And these are some of the schools we have gone to to plant our trees. The youth, we need to engage the youth also. Let's use the power of social media for our youth in telling them about biodiversity conservation and protection. And let us build career that is environmentally oriented. Volunteering is very important. Youth need to volunteer in all these things we are talking about. And this is one of the activities that we, carry, that we uh, carried out. It's called Play for, Nation, uh, Play for Nature Football Competition, where we engage the youth. And before the football competition, we tell them, we told them about uh, environmental and how to conserve the environment. Now, let me be going round off with social civil society like Save Sahara Network, we are civil society. We carry out environmental protection activity. We make sure we conserve nature, we protect nature. And so I want end NGOs all over civil society, let us carry out action that need to nature protection. Let's encourage tree planting and let us distribute seed and even seedling to people to plant and take part in negotiation and conferences that we bring out policy. And this is some of the things that we did at Safe Sahara Network in empowering youth in our area. And some of these youth, after they finished, we gave all of them certificates and we even gave some of them scholarships. And we even collaborate with our national uh, security agency in planting trees around their area. And in local area, we introduce even cook stoves, improve efficient cook stove to reduce energy consumption, to reduce firewood consumption, in local area. Now, let us back to where I'm coming from. 2020 World Environment Day is today. And again, the title is, is time for nature. We need to focus on nature. And if we need to focus for nature, we need to wake up. We need to take notice. We need to raise our voices. We need to care for the plant. And what are the actions that we need to take? We must change the way we treat our nature we must change the way we produce and consume food. We must conserve and restore wildlife. We must promote environmentally friendly infrastructure, as I've told us, the green building, green infrastructure. And we need to transform our economies to become custodian of nature. I want to appreciate all those organizations that have been giving us money over the years. And I say thank you for listening. Over to you, Bidemi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fola. That is wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm sure we are all learning. We need to wake up. Wake up. <laughs> wake up. It's time for nature. We need to plant trees. We need to protect and conserve our biodiversity, the animal species we have around us. So we have some questions here, sir, for you. So I will be reading those questions. If you still have more questions, you can type or you can just use an emoji to show that you have questions. So the first question says that, Dr. Fola, are you listening, sir? Yes, I'm listening, please. Okay. What are the directives measure that can be put in place to help conserve our environment for the present and future generations? I know you mentioned a few when you were talking, but maybe you can help us to elaborate it, sir. Okay, as I've rightly said, individually and different stakeholders, we have roles to play. At an individual level, I've told us that we need to embark and change our culture of doing things. We need to be very conscious of the environment. This is the present time. And for the government and for the other stakeholders, we need to put in place policy. We need to regulate the way we produce our products, even the business people, we need to regulate the way we do business. It's not business as usual. For the schools, I've told us about the curriculum. If we develop the curriculum and make sure it's environmentally focused, we are building the present and we are building the future. We, if you plant trees for today, it's not for today alone. We are planting trees for the future. If we protect our biological diversity today from extinction, we are making plans for the future generation to see something. If we kill all our pangolin today, if we kill all our lion today, if we kill all our even elephant today, there's nothing for the future. 
So whatever we do today, we know we are not doing it for today, it's for the future. So we have a lot of things that I've already highlighted that we need to do. But most importantly, we need to change our mindset. Our mm -hmm. mindset is very important. If we don't have a good mindset toward the environment, there's nothing we can do in protection. So let's change our mindset and let's be environmentally play, conscious and that will translate to the future. Yeah. Join the campaign. Tell your younger ones at home mm. they should be environmental friendly. Let's start from you. So the other question mm -hmm. here says, please, considering the fact that climate change is a natural change that can't be controlled by man, how can we now reduce the rate of biodiversity loss considering the fact that climate change can be controlled by man? Oh, this is a very interesting question. And yeah. let me tell us this fact. Who really caused climate change? Yeah. Who introduced yeah. factors? Who released greenhouse gases into the environment? Mm. We are the one. We are the one that caused climate change. We are the one that increased the CO2 that is causing global warming. So we are the one that introduced imbalance into the environment. So if we continue to release carbon into the atmosphere, even continue to release polluter into the environment, we'll continue to do what? Disbalance the environment. And then that leads to what? Climate change. So climate change and biodiversity, they have something in common. Because the, let me take an example, tree, forest, vegetation. By the time you remove vegetation, vegetation is supposed to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And this is our biodiversity we are talking about. By the time we remove all this vegetation, we remove all this tree, then we continue to have accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And by the time we have more increase in carbon dioxide, then it leads to what? Global warming. And then we have ice melting, flooding, and all those natural disasters. So we, human beings, we can control it. Climate change is not just a natural occurring event. And we cause a lot of greenhouse gases emission. Then we, have, we continue to have global warming and then the climate are changing in our climate so it is we that are supposed to change the way we do things and know that the nature cannot be controlled yes sir yes sir thank you so much sir thank you sir we need to change our mindset we need to reduce our excesses the way we put waste to the atmosphere the fumes and all those things that causes climate changes we can actually reduce climate change if you and i are ready to do that so another question sir what are the roles of urban forestation in biodiversity conservation in area where deforestation rate is very high? For example, in Sierra Leone. Okay, this question, is, we, I'm having two faces to this question. This question is talking about deforestation and we are talking about urban reforestation. Def urban reforestation, uh, urban, uh, urbanization leads to what? deforestation. Because by the time we expand our urban area, we are increasing places we are living. We are increasing infrastructural development. And so we continue to encroach into the natural forest and we continue to cause deforestation. And so who is the cause of this? We human beings, we are the one again that are encroaching into the natural environment and causing deforestation. Now, that is why we are now saying if we have to build a uh, city, if we have to live in city, now we have to bring back all those trees that we removed, that we fell in the process of infrastructural development. And that is why we are now saying we should practice urban forestry. And that is why we are saying we should practice green building. We should practice rooftop uh, green uh, uh, gardening. We should have garden in our houses. We should have garden in our balconies. We can have garden around us. And we should have trees in our streets. And in, in doing all this, we are bringing back the biodiversity. Because if we continue to plant trees and we have vegetation in our cities, all those birds, all those biological diversity that we have lost, eventually they will be coming back gradually. I feel. I feel so sad at times when I see birds laying their nests in rooftop in our ceilings because we remove all the trees. 
where they're supposed to lay their eggs. Now they are finding their way into our, our ceilings. So let us find a way to make sure that we, we bring batteries into our cities and then that is how we can curb all this deforestation. Yes, we want, to, we want timbers, but let us plant more trees. Mm. Thank you so much, sir. Another question, permaculture shows to be a good approach to neutral conservation. However, little efforts are being ch channeled towards promoting it. How do we scale up adoption and promotion of permaculture to both rural and urban areas? Oh, this has to do, once again, this has to do with the power of our social media. This has to do with the power of our enlightenment. This has to do with, especially among all the stakeholders I've mentioned, our civil society, our NGOs, because they have more central roles in introduction of all these uh, real practices that we have to bring back something like these agricultural practices in our even urban areas. We can plant food in an intensive system that can produce even nutrition for people in the city. But we need people to get awareness about this thing. And second thing, it costs money. We need our institution, financial institution to provide finance. We need our government to provide finance because to start this thing, if you don't have your personal money, you need to get loan at a very ridiculous uh, interest rate or at even a free rate. Let our agricultural bank release money for our youth, for our young people who wants to go into such uh, practices in order to bring more food and more environmentally friendly uh, practice into our uh, uh, cities and into our area. So we need awareness creation. We need the involvement of civil society, NGO, government to participate their role and financial institutions can release funds for our team youth to practice what they love to do. Yeah, yeah, and thank God now there has been uh, there have been awareness, there have been creation of awareness. Even our architectural, um, prof our people in architectural professions, they are also putting together some greening things. Like they make sure the ceiling is green. There is environmental greening of the urban area just to promote this. So thank you, sir. I think, okay, I'm from Syria alone. How can I be? an active member of Safe Sahara. Excellent. Safe Sahara Network, we have a website. We, have a, we are on Facebook. We are on website. We are on Twitter. We are on Instagram. And most importantly, you can get our contact on the Facebook because our Facebook is very, very active. So if you get in touch with us, we can link you up with our WhatsApp group. With our WhatsApp group, that is where we easily communicate among ourselves and get ourselves involved in activities. So you can check our Facebook page, you can chat me, you can contact me, and we're going to get you involved. Thank you, sir. As a student, as a student, if you involved, okay, as a student, if you are involved in tree planting, can Safe Sahara Network fund such an operation? Can you, can Safe Sahara fund uh, tree planting operations? Yeah, Safe Sahara Network, right now, uh, we love and we encourage the youth and even students, young people to start planting trees get in touch with us if we can provide you with money we can provide you with resources you need we have seedlings we have material that we can give to you if you really show us that interest you you convince us about what you want to do where you want to do it we are ready to collaborate we're ready to partner and we're ready to assist in what in in any way that we know is uh is easy for us to do but get in touch with me discuss further with me and then we'll tell you how to go about this thank you sir i i love this particular question <laughs> please what are the opportunities for pharmaceutical industry in climate change or biodiversity wow pharmaceutical industries now yeah. in university there's a course that i taught when a few years ago we call it ethnobotany 
And in ethobrotenin is where we connect pharmaceutical industry with nature, with environment. Now everybody is going organic, even in the, in the medicine that we consume. And now, how can we link it up? All these plants we are taking, all these tablets we are taking, all this syrup we are taking, medicine we are taking, they are from nature. And from nature, we find solution to our body. And even the food we eat from nature, they are food. If you eat good balanced diet, mm. you visit the hospital less. So all these things, we just need to be mindful of what we eat. Be mindful of what you breathe in. Be mindful of the environment you stay. Then you take less of medicine. I will not tell you now just to, that we should start production and we start production. Even the coronavirus, they are now, you can see what uh, Madagascar gives to us. It's their local medicine. Madagascar did not give us tablets. Madagascar did not give us injection. But they gave us their local medicine produced or local herbs. So there are medicine local herbs. There are medicine in nature. There are medicine in our environment. Biodiversity is medicine. Let us explore more of this. And then we are connected, connected with pharmaceutical industry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. OK, in Nigeria, where school curriculum aren't flexible to allow students to leave their less needed activities to nature's development and appreciation. What are the measures being put in place to allow some of our students to join Safe Sahara Network while other classes might be holding on campus? Oh. How can you combine volunteering with okay. academic, with academic. <laughs> work? Right yes. now, you see, most of what we do, I'm a lecturer too. And I can't I can ask my students not to attend their classes and coming to be going to plant trees or things like that. We make sure that activity that we fix in, we, we carry out are flexible. We make sure that whatever we are doing uh, will not coincide or we disrupt your, uh, your classes. Now we are talking about tree planting. Tree will not run away from you. We plant the way we plant the trees. So you are going to schedule your plan, you plan your time, you plan your activities in order to get connected with the nature. So if we want you to plant trees, we won't tell you that it is when you are having classes that you should get out of your class to go and plant trees. No, trees will always be there for you to plant. After your class, you can always plant. You can plant in the evening. You can plant very early in the morning. You can plant on weekends. When it is dry season, you can water in weekend, on weekends and or in the evening when the classes are over. So you are going to be flexible in the way you carry out your uh, planting activity. Not that you are going to leave your classes to be involved in this activity we are telling you about. Priority is what you need. Yes, sir. And I'm sure you'll be glad to show your children that I planted that tree 20 years ago. I'm sure you'll be glad to do that. So yes. join us, Sarah. What's your view on biodiversity and forest product utilization, sir? Because we can't do without using timbers for one thing or the other. Oh, excellent question. Yeah. This is one of my professors that told me this. My professor of forest economics, Professor Labo de Popola. There was a time we were discussing, and he told me, he's a professor of forest economics. He studied forest economy for years. And it told me that there's no way we can tell people not to fell trees. There's no way we can tell people not to go into the forest. And there's no way people will abide to that. But there's one thing we need to do when you fell one plant, two or three. As you are cutting, plant more. We know we want, we want product from the forest. We know we have needs. We know we have demands, and this, our nature supply what we need. But are we mindful of sustainability? Are we sustaining what we are removing? Are you replacing what you are removing? So I will not tell you today, I will not say people should not touch. I will not say people should not fell tree. I will not say people should not explore resources from the nature, but it must be sustainable. We need to replace. We need to monitor and we need to observe what we remove. 
With this, we are talking sustainable management and sustainable exploitation. It is not that we should not touch. We have to be sustainable. Thank you, sir. We have two more questions to go, but uh, we will take those questions after the next presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Fela Babala. Thank you so much. So I will be inviting the second presenter, Mr. Abubakar Ringin. So I'd like to read his biography before he comes to give us his own lecture. So Ringim is a conservation biologist where he deeply advocates for the protection and sustainability of natural resources and wildlife. He held his bachelor's degree in zoology from BUK and master's degree in biodiversity conservation from the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. His research focus on citizen science projects and pressing conservation issues, which includes urban ecology, protected areas, zoonotic disease, and sustainability. Mr. Ringim is involved deeply in Nigeria Bird Atlas Project, where he is serving as the secretary of the Arewa Atlas team. In 2019, he was among the 17 member committee, the technical working group selected by the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development for the Development and Implementation of Wildlife Disease Surveillance System in Nigeria. In 2019, he also served as Secretary LOC for the 6th Nigeria Tropical, Bi Biological, Tropical Biology Association Conference. He is a co -founded, he co founded the Federal University Duse Conservation Society and is serving as their secretary. He is a member of many committees in his university, such as the Chairman Committee on Maintenance and Revenue Generation of the Federal University Duse Zoological Garden. Is a member for, is a member of Faculty of Science, Seminar, Workshop, and Conference Committee, and Assistant Coordinator. He has at his Field trip, he has attended different kind of field trip. He's a level coordinator since 2017, and he has graduated over 20 undergraduate students. He's a, he's a recipient of two commendation letters from the university management. He has, he has more than 20 publications in both national and international journals, including important discoveries. He has discovered a lot of things. He is a member of Society of Conservation Biology since 2016, and broadly, he has strong passion and interest mm -hmm. in trying to promote biodiversity conservation and impact in Nigeria. So let's welcome Abubakar Rengin. Yeah, welcome, Mr. Rengin. Mm, thank you. Please, let's mute Did our, let's mute our um, audio, and we can type our questions. Yeah, welcome, Mr. Rengin. Mr. Ringim, I'm giving you the floor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ebdi. And uh, everyone once again, uh, to World Environment Day 2020. And uh, I will particularly welcome my HOD in person of Associate Professor Dr. Musa Mustafa Dogara, who is with us. Yeah, welcome, sir. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Yes, we can. OK, this is a food for thought to all of us. Have we felt nature, environment, and biodiversity? I hope we can all have our answers at the end of this presentation. Or oh, right now, we can have our answers. So I will, uh, I will start by defining what is nature. It is the physical material world or universe or otherwise life in general. It also refers to geology, the biodiversity which Dr. Fola Babalola have explained deeply, which comprise the flora and fauna. We have the oceans, the forest ecosystem, as well as the rocks, all are termed nature. And he must have been in contact with nature for time immemorial for a very long period of time. People have been interacting and engaging themselves uh, with nature through aesthetics, beautification, 
a lot of us enjoy going to national parks for bird watching, for safari, for sport hunting and ETC, and also for just leisure. And for medicine, a lot of plant species, as well as animals, fats, for instance, and skins, serve uh, medicinal purposes to humans. It is estimated that 28,000 plant species have medical, uh, medicinal importance. Agriculture, raw materials for our industries, raw materials for construction, for clothing, and uh, ETC. And ecosystem services, nature provides us with ecosystem services, the provision of flood control, the provision of uh, uh, air quality, and ETC, all are part of nature. So I'm not going to uh, talk much about biodiversity because it has been highlighted uh, uh, intensively by Dr. Kola Babalola. So how can we connect with the nature? There are so many ways we can connect with nature depending on our individual uh, uh, preferences. If you have ever hugged a tree, you have connected with the nature. If you have ever watched a sunset rise, you have connected with the nature. If you have ever listened to bird calls, you have connected with the nature. And if you want to connect with the nature, you can take a nature walk. And ultimately, you can observe nature. So how do we observe nature? There are so many ways, as we can see, through which we can observe nature. But I'm going to talk about two platforms, that is uh, about citizen science, two platforms under citizen science that we can watch or connect with nature. What is a, a citizen science? A project which I am deeply involved. It is a concept which engages the public in a scientific project. You don't need to be a scientist. You don't need to be a researcher to be a citizen scientist. Everybody, the public, can, can be citizen scientists. And who are those who are citizen scientists? There are people who have chosen to use their free time and resources to engage in the scientific work processes. Like for instance, embed atlases to map the distribution of birds, coral reefs, monitor the health status of coral reefs, even to monitor bed population trend or to monitor bed migration. They are all part of citizen science projects. And uh, for quite a very long period of time, citizen scientists have generated a very huge data set. And this data set have yielded a lot of important discoveries and results. Data sets from citizen scientists can be used to track biological changes like range extension or constriction in biological species. Data from citizen scientists can also be uh, uh, determine the impacts of human activities on biological diversity. And worldwide, there are a number of organizations involved in citizen science movements. In the United States, we have the National Wildlife Federation with over 4 million members, citizen scientists, who go out and map biodiversity and submit observations from their gardens, from their backyards, and uh, from the urban green spaces. And we have the Woodland Trust in the United Kingdom. And we have the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology in South Africa. And in the Nigeria, of course, we have the former Ornithological Institute, the Aplori, Apil Adventist Ornithological Research Institute, who is leading the citizen science project. So I'm going to talk about one of the platform, one of the citizen science project, which is uh, uh, Animal Demography Unit, Virtual Museum of the Animal Demography Unit. And this is a practical way through which we can connect with nature. It is the leading biodiversity project, citizen science project on the African continent. And they have various uh, biodiversity projects, ranging from BOP, that is birds without plumage, that is uh, literally birds with aberrations or leucism. And they have a fish map, distribution map for fish. They have reptile map, distribution map for reptiles. And they have lepi map, they have tree map, distribution map for trees. And they have odonata distribution map for dragonflies and damselflies. They have frog map, distribution map for frogs and ETC. They have bed pigs, distribution map for beds. So the ADU aims to provide a platform for citizen scientists, for people, the general public, to contribute to biodiversity projects. We need to map 
the distribution of biodiversity on the African continent. Generic distribution maps for biodiversity, for frogs, for reptiles, for amphibians, for uh, uh, odonata, for birds, also to serve as a conservation and education tools. Because if you, even, uh, if you go out and map a species, if you don't know the species, you don't need to worry. Just submit your observation and expert will identify the species for you, thereby improving your uh, knowledge, local knowledge. This is the distribution map for birds in Nigeria in the bed pitch database of the Animal Demography Unit. Most of the observations uh, are from the north because I have made a lot of observations from the north compared to other parts uh, of the country. And there are very few people who contribute to virtual museum observations. This is a distribution map for lapping dog in the bed pigs database, which is the most submitted or observed uh, record on the bed pigs database. And these are all my records in the various layer ADU projects. You can see in alone, I have over 600 records. In the dog beetle, I have 10, fish map, three, frog map, lepi map, over 100 uh, records, or Donata, over 70 records. And in total, I have over 1,000 records, photographic records submitted to ADU. And you can see the ID records. Over 800 species have been identified. I have over 170 species that are awaiting identifications. And you can see the number of taxa and the number of TDS, quarter degree cells. Through, uh, uh, that is the where the species are uh, were marked. This is spider map, the distribution map for spiders in Nigeria. You see, we have a very long way to go in terms of mapping the distribution of spiders in Nigeria. We need more people to do that. We need more citizen scientists. This is the distribution map for weaver nest on the uh, project. And this is the mushroom map, distribution map for mushroom. We have a very long way to go. And this is the reptile map, distribution map for reptiles, lizards, snakes, uh, skins, and ETC. And this is the distribution map for Odonata, dragonflies and themselfflies. Uh, the blue uh, color are historical records, while the green ones are current or observed uh, recent uh, records. This is the frog map. And this is lepi map, distribution map for butterflies and themselfflies in Nigeria. So, with all these observations, are there remarkable observations that we have, uh, or that I have particularly observed? Yes. These publications are from my observations uh, from the field. They are all new discoveries. They are range extensions and leucism in long tail glossy styling. And they were reported for the first time in Nigeria. And for the leucism, it is, report, it is reported for the first time, as far as we know, as far as ontology is concerned, because uh, leucism was reported in eight species of uh, uh, stallions. This is the first time lucidum were reported in long tail glossy stallion. And uh, I have a paper in press in biodiversity observation about the distribution map for birds in Nigeria, bird pigs, report on the Atlas of the Birds of Nigeria, 2019. So let me quickly talk about iNaturalist, which is also another citizen science uh, project. And uh, it aims to map and share observation of biodiversity across the globe iNaturalist may be accessed through its website or from its mobile application. That is a mobile app that you can simply download from Play Store and sign up and start mapping and observing and sharing observations from wherever you are in Nigeria. And we uh, have about 130 citizen scientists in iNaturalist, and uh, I have the highest observations. I have over 800 species, uh, observations and over 300 uh, 300 species in iNaturalist. These are the top uh, citizen scientists or observers on iNaturalist in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, we have submitted or observed over 2,000, uh, we have over 2,000 species or uh, observations, sorry, observations. This, uh, this is the distribution map for the citizen scientists in Nigeria on iNaturalist. This is a profile of my observations. And this is the distribution map for my observations. And in general, this is the distribution map for birds in Nigeria. 
You see from the parts of Maiduguri as a result of Boko Haram issues and other insurgency, uh, almost nothing has been uh, observed. And uh, if you look at parts of Zampara too, there is a lot need to be done. Also from the south, uh, south, south parts of Patawakot and Calabar, you know, we have very few citizen scientists there. This is the distribution map for plants in Nigeria. You see, we have a very long way to go. We have over 7,900 plant species in Nigeria, but still, this is what we have as per distribution map for plants is concerned on iNaturalists in Nigeria. So what are the benefits of all this data? We can, if you are a researcher or if you are an academician, you can publish some of these uh, uh, results or uh, data. Also, the data can be used in decision and policy making because it tells us where species, uh, where we have the highest concentration of species, like biodiversity hotspots or IBA important bed areas or IBA important biodiversity areas or Ramsar sites, for instance. And uh, the data can also be used to generate or for conservation and management planning, like where to set protected areas, forest reserve, Ramsar site, IBA, ETC. It can also be used to enhance open space and wildlife habitat. It can also be used to improve animal and human health. It can also be used to minimize human wildlife conflicts. As a result, our population is growing. We encourage onto natural habitats, getting in conflict with uh, wildlife. So what are the benefits to public? The data can rebuild potential areas for local tourism, where locals can serve as tour guides and women can sell souvenirs. It can also enhance scientific and technology literacy in biodiversity mapping. It can also improve understanding of the local biodiversity, the plant and animals around us. Just from your, your at home, from your window, you can map insects and just submit. You, it improves your knowledge. Scientists and the public share ecological knowledge and taxonomic skills about biodiversity. However, there are only less than 200 citizen scientists in Nigeria on Nigeria Bed Atlas project. And on iNaturalist, there are only 130 citizen scientists with over with Nigeria having over 200 million population. This is these are some of the photographic uh, records I have observed. This is the leucistic long tail glossy style. And naturally, this is not the way this uh, bird species look like. It has a white tail, and uh, under the chin there is a white. So this is an aberration. And this is the gray back fiscal uh, I observed in Adama, which is a range extension. Naturally, the distribution, the range is around Lake Chad. This is a barbed patcher, a dragonfly. This is Causus maculatus, night adder. And this is common diadem, a butterfly, little bee eater, abdim stock. And this is me in the field. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ringim. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have a few questions for you and Dr. Fola because I'm just gonna continue with the former questions now. So I will want you to answer, both of you to answer the questions. So this, okay, knowing fully well that we have a very rich plant biodiversity in Africa and Nigeria specifically, how do we encourage economic development of medical plants in Nigeria? Are there, are there any measure in place Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Hello, yes, can, you can, you can you hear me? So we have we have several questions for you. So I will want the two guest uh, speaker, Dr. Fola and uh, Mr. Ringi to just help us in answering the question okay. before we go to mm. the next agenda. So this question says, now you fully well that we have a very rich plant biodiversity in Africa and Nigeria especially. How do we encourage economic development of medicinal plants in Nigeria? Are there any measure in place? Like, do we have any measure in place for that? So maybe Mr. Ringim should go first. Okay. Yes, yeah. uh, we are. Nigeria is very rich in terms of plant diversity, and uh, uh, naturally, we have a lot of uh, local uh, medicinal uh, people that are involved in traditional medicine. But unfortunately, government failed to integrate them into modern uh, pharmacological uh, system, which I think it is a way forward in terms of this uh, 
uh, internal medicine. Okay, thank you so much. Dr. Fala. Okay, this is a very excellent question. There are sometimes my question, we have this question when we're taking them ethno-forestry. And one thing that is about development of medicinal plant is uh, the effort we are putting into it in terms of research. Because with research, it's going to bring out what are the active ingredients and which one is put into each other, number one. Number two, how do we get close to this, our local healers, our traditional medicinal healers? As researchers, do we get close to them? Do we even give them recognition in the country? Do we even believe in what they do? I know when I was growing up, my mom combined Agbo, this thing we call Agbo, import, combined me with medicine, combined with tablets. But she would, there, would, there would never be a day that we will be deficient of this local concussion in our house. And if you have a simple malaria, you just need a cup of Agbo, and then the next 30 minutes, you are playing football. You are where? But how do we give recognition to this in this part of the world? Our policymakers see it as something we can really work close with. Do, because I, I, right now, I do what I call indigenous knowledge system. I do community forestry. I try to relate with local people and look at how they live. If somebody tells you that you should not enter a forest with our policy now, with our paper policy, people will enter into the forest. But if you tell a local juju man to put something red and white in the four corner of the forest and tell them, if you enter in this forest, you will die. Nobody will enter it. That is indigenous knowledge system. So our local medicine is part of indigenous knowledge system that we need to move close to. If somebody combine two, three leaves together and they can cure malaria, what are the active ingredients that we can develop to cure other sicknesses and that malaria. There are local medicines that can cure even coronavirus that we are shouting these days. So let's move close to these people. Let's be innovative with the local healers and know how they do their thing. From there, we are going to develop our whole model medicine. Thank you. Yes, Thank you so much, sir. I just want to add to that question. Do you think creating awareness on this indigenous system will help in conserving our biodiversity or increase the exploitation? If, if, if we're able to explore what the local people use, because right now, whenever I'm teaching indigenous knowledge system, people will always ask me, which religion are you? Mm. Are you a traditional man or you are a Christian or you are a Muslim? Or do you believe in all this devil, devil thing they do in the local area? I say, we don't need mm -hmm. to be calling everything that they do in local area devil. They are not just devilish like that. They are knowledge built over years and they are used to. So when we are talking about how can we really, the question now, do we need to give more awareness to them? Do we really need to give more recognition to them? I will say indirectly, yes. Let us know what they use. Let us know what they do. And from there, we can refine it to the science that we are known with to the science we are used to. So let's move close to the local area. Let's look at what they do. And from there, we can evolve our own scientific way of doing things. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Community participation. Let them participate. Thank you, sir. So a question, comparing the forest, OK, comparing forest ecosystem to agro-based agro ecosystem, which one is more advantageous? Is it the agro-based ecosystem or the forest ecosystem. <laughs> we just mm -hmm. abandon agriculture for forestry. <laughs> this is a very interesting question. Ringim, let me just quickly chip in. You can now add to what I want to say. It's okay, uh, it's okay. The, the, question, the person that has this question, I know you must have eaten today. And so you will know that agriculture is very important. And you know without forests, there will not be a roof on top of your house because there will not be wood and furniture. I don't know, maybe you are sitting on wood right now. There will not be wood. But mm -hmm. as, as I rightly said the other time, we need to find a way to, to, to come together, to work together. As a forester, I teach agroforestry in school. And in agroforestry, I try to bring in 
forest crop with tree crop on a given piece of land. So we need to work together. I can't tell, I will not tell you that people should not farm. And I will not tell you that forest is more important than agri because I do forestry. And I will not fight with somebody who's telling me that agri is more important than this forest that you are doing. Yes, it's a give and take. Let us practice the two together. Let's agriculturists, people, those people are agriculture, the agriculturists, be mindful of what they do to the forest. We have to be sustainable, as I said. Mm. It's high time we stop all this slash and burn method of agriculture. It's high time we stop just expansion and expansion of agricultural land without being mindful of biological diversity. So even when we want to clear land, let's pair trees that we know are valuable to us and not we do total clearing. We can combine the two together. Ringim, you can take over. I think you have answered uh, this question very well. <laughs> yeah, actually, it is very hard to, you know, to convince people not to clear forest for cultivation. And, uh, but uh, sincerely speaking, it is, uh, if they can integrate this uh, agroforestry, it is the sustainable way and it is the way forward as far as uh, agriculture and ecosystem is concerned. Thank you, thank you, doctor. Thank you, Mr. Ringim. I think I, this, there's a question here. Maybe that this person should be one of your students, doctor. <laughs> yeah, from Kenya, right? I'm not sure. My question here, okay, how can we measure the quality of hair? I think you have skipped one question. Okay. Yes, one thing Kenyans have done about timber is oh, changing no, no. the culture of using indigenous species for timber. No, this is timber. not a question. It's just, okay. it's just a comment. Yeah, it's just a uh, comment. Okay. So this question says, how can we measure the quality of hair? Then, how can you relate, how can you compare biostatistics into biodiversity conservation scheme? Okay. Who wants to go first, so, doctor? You want to, okay. Yes, go, go ahead, doctor. Oh, well, this question, this man is trying to take us to physics and chemistry. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> he must be your student. <laughs> in order to measure the quality of air. Right now, in this part of the world, we are still facing the issue of available technology to be able to do direct measurement. So because of that, there are different indirect measure of uh air quality even by mere observation you'll be able to observe exactly, exactly. yeah maybe maybe dusty or maybe mm -hmm. the air is smoky or maybe the air is you use your senses if it's smelling and all that even if there is a lot of carbon monoxide in the air you will always perceive it every time that the trailer passes uh, where i'm going i try to try to sniff in this kind of carbon monoxide because at times it used to be smell a good smell, but you don't know you are smelling and ca inhaling carbon monoxide. But there are equipment these days, there are gadgets that we can use that are not available to us. Yeah. So yes, how can uh, the I think you can use a uh, air quality index, which works like a thermometer that can measure the levels of pollution in the air. Hmm. Thank you. And the second, uh, but the second uh, question, he said, uh, how can we Compare How can we compare by statistics into biodiversity conservation scheme? Uh, actually, after you have collected your data, you have to explore, uh, explore some statistical analysis to, you know, to analyze your data. Maybe if you're interested to compare relative uh, abundance of species or density or frequency or species richness, the number of species in an area. So that is where you employ the use of by statistics in biodiversity conservation. Thank you, sir. So how can citizen science be incorporated into other aspects of biodiversity? More so, how can youth of today be carried along or encouraged to be, to be, a, to be citizen scientists, even children? How can we catch them young? <laughs> Already, uh, citizen, science, uh, citizen science is part of biodiversity conservation. It is an initiative under biodiversity conservation. How can you engage the general public? because we are fast losing species and we, do, we have uh, very few expertise and there is no time and we have limited uh, funds 
to conserve biolo biological diversity. You're talking about more than 1.7 million described species, while we have a lot awaiting identification. So how much time do you have to conserve all this biological diversity? How many conservation biologists do we have in Nigeria, for instance? And how many biological diversity do we have in Nigeria? So we need to look for shortcuts. So, and the shortcuts, citizen science is one of the shortcuts where we engage the general public, where they can contribute their observations and uh, they are mapping towards biodiversity conservation. And uh, this question is uh, particularly uh, very, very important. How can we catch young? How can we catch children, you know, at a very young age? Uh, uh, it's all about uh, creating public awareness about citizen science project. It's all about uh, public awareness. Now, some of us are here and they have learned or they have here for the first time maybe about citizen science. So it's to carry the good work and continue our, and also to explain or advocate for citizen science uh, concepts to others as well as to young children. And uh, most importantly, we can introduce curriculum in our primary schools where we can engage citizen, young children at a very young age to learn about local biodiversity, that is the plant and animal species around them, and where they can map and observe and submit uh, observations. Okay, in addition, let me just quickly chip in one or two things. That is excellent, uh, Mr. Ringim. Just, we need to do, they can't get young cut a cut uh, two faces. One, cut them young at home, and then we have the cut, cut them young outside the home. Mm. Outside the home, we have schools, we have the societies, we have people in the neighborhood, and within the home, we have we, the parents, telling our young ones, our children, to be environmentally friendly. Now, what, how do we interact with the environment? How do we exploit the environment? We need to let our children know. And that means that we too, that are called the parents, we need to start to know. And we need to be conscious of the environment. Now, outside the home is now, I'll focus more on the school. Like what Safe Sarah is doing, we go to school, we plant trees. We don't just plant trees and go away. We engage the students in planting the trees. We engage our teachers in planting the trees so that by the time teachers and students plant trees, they, both of them we know. And then taking care of trees is another thing because a lot of people who are engaged in tree planting these days, I just feel worried because people just plant trees and go away. People don't put in place management practices and how do I take care of this tree? Exactly, to exactly. You don't, mm. talk, you don't just plant trees and go away and just go and sleep. So whenever we plant trees in school, we teach them that they need to water, they need to prune, they need to watch for infection, they need to watch for any insect or disease attack. They need to at least even protect the trees from any external factor. Maybe the domestic animal, we see goat now or cow moving everywhere. How do you protect the seedlings from being eaten up? So those are the things we teach our students, our young ones about tree planting. Now, after that, we need to do look at other things like the how do we interact with the environment? Do you just like the plastic, like uh, the way we explore resources? Are we putting? Are we already setting our mind on sustainability? All those things we need to start knowing them gradually, and then as parents we teach our children, as teachers we teach them, as civil societies, as NGO, and even in churches we need to start saying this thing in mosque. We need to start this, this thing. The traditional people, they are even doing better things because they are closer to the nature. So the traditional people, at least they are mindful of what they do about the environment. So it's high time we start doing that. Yeah, curriculum, government is in the hand of the government. I can't wake up today and change curriculum, but I can wake up today and tell people about planting tree and be mindful of what we do with the nature. And uh, also, if I may add something here, uh, part of the technical working group that I was involved last year, uh, part of the surveillance system, uh, is to develop a EE, uh, environmental, uh, environmental and ecosystem, what do you call it? Education and environmental conservation curriculum for our primary and secondary schools. 
which we have submitted to the Ministry of Environment, and from there they will take it to the National Assembly for reading before we can finally adopt it as a policy and start uh, having conservation uh, education curriculum in our primary schools and secondary schools. It's part of the thing that I personally developed in that technical working group. Uh, thank you so much. That is good news. Mm. So this person wants to know how he or she can join iNaturalist. Uh, it's just to go online, just type uh, Google iNaturalist and you sign up, just like how you sign up uh, an email address. You put your username and uh, your password. And whatever you see around your home, if you see a cockroach, if you see a, a butterfly, just uh, snap it and just submit it to iNaturalist. It is very simple and easy to use. I hope uh, time will have permitted me that I will have uh, show how to uh, submit records to iNaturalist, but it is there online. It is very easy. Yeah. So, so I'll, 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 one, line, one line, please. Sorry, be me. I just quickly say if you want to do I naturalist, because if you look at the banner behind me, it's one of those things that we taught students here, even in Eloni. We have gone to some school to do yes. two steps for I naturalist. I naturalist is a, a software that you have on your phone. You need to download it, install it, and get registered with it on your phone. So, but if you want to know how to use it, you can go online and read it. But you download it, you install it on your phone, and you use the app to take photograph of any observation you have around. We call it observation. You can observe anything. You can observe okay. insects, trees, plants, as long as they are living thing. You take mm. the photo, you submit it. You can identify it yourself, or people on the community, on the iNaturalist community can help you to identify. So it is not only when you can identify that you can use the app. You can use it when you cannot when you don't even know how to identify but the most important thing is we use the app to collect information observation around us upload it and people can see so you as an ordinary person even if you don't read science you can mm. use the app and that is why it's called a citizen science yeah even if you don't you don't need to go to school to be a citizen scientist exactly yeah, yeah. so i think the, the one has been answered how can i become citizen science join i naturalist Join Safe Sahara, join uh, Bed Clubs, join uh, Atlasin Group. You can, those are the, the ways it can become citizen science. I think that one has been answered. Okay, lastly, maybe, how can one build a career in citizen science? I think that one has been answered too. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I need. We need to. Doctor, I need to explain it's this. Citizen but, science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is citizen science a course in botany, ecology, ecology. or a program <laughs> on its own? Okay. Can I pursue a PhD in citizen it's science in or as postdoc fellow? Yeah, you need to explain this. Uh. <laughs> That's Go ahead. Citizen science, as I know it to be, is not something that we just call like a career. It's just something that you pick interest in. You are a it's a volunteer. It's a volunteer project. Volunteer activities that mm. you can do on your own or you can do with a group of people. So mm. it is something you pick interest in and it takes you to your environment. It takes you to the nature. It makes you to be more observant and make you to be more caring. Because if you know most of the resources around you, most of the border by the right around you, then you let other people out, outside uh, in other parts of the world to know about it. So you can be an accountant, you can be a scientist, you can be even a banker, you can be an engineer, and any profession you are carrying on is just developing interest and volunteer in capturing observation around you and let other people in other parts of the world to know what you have around you. So that is citizen yeah. science. And uh, I think one, uh, one good thing about citizen science data is that you can use citizen science data to pursue your master's or PhD program. You can use citizen science data. Hello, okay, okay. Hello. I said you can use citizen science data to pursue your PhD or master's program. Okay, and there is a paper here for us in the chat group, so you can just go online and read. So, like, citizen science is not something very big, it's just a term you
Hello. Like a terminology to to allow you to be part of nature. So like he like he he mentioned earlier. So I think uh, the question about citizen science has been answered. What are the measures that individual can take to increase the air quality and engage people on the process? Also, what do you think, sir, about domestication of biodiversity? Mr. Ringin, do you want to go first? Yes. Uh, actually, we conservationists, we discourage keeping uh, plants, uh, especially animals, wild animals at home as pets, domesticating them. We need to see them in the wild. So we strongly discourage uh, domesticating wild animals. I, I'm, I'm in support of that too. And only, well for now, because before you can talk about domestication, domestication is not something you just wake up today. You pick an animal from the wild, you take it to your home and you think it has been domesticated. No. Mm. We need to study its ecology. Yeah. The food it eats. Ah, domestication mm. is takes a process and the process is long. So you mm. can't wake up today, you pick up a snake, you take it to your house, and you say it has been domesticated. One day the snake can bite you. So we are talking about when you are talking of like all those animal, agricultural animals that we know they have been domesticated, like the goat sheep or all those ones it takes a long period of time because before they get used to human beings and staying with us and they are not harboring some diseases and all those things that the, the part the coronavirus we are talking about today everybody knows we have been told that this the origination is from uh white animals so we don't want to actually domestic uh, encourage like that that you wake up one day and you think catching white animals you have domestic it. So, those ones that have been domesticated that people consume at home, well, are continuing with those ones. And well, that is why sometimes, even in our zoological gardens, if we try to keep some animals in our in captivity, they don't uh, uh, breed because you need to study their ecological requirements. You need to study their biological requirements before you keep any animal in captivity. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm very glad this, this has been so interesting because the participant has been like, they are still intact. Nobody's leaving, meaning that they are really enjoying <laughs> this webinar. So well, thank you so much. Okay, in this era of Nera and Kobo, <laughs> how can citizen science be made active? You know what, I, before you answer, yes, sir, I have a uh, problem with that after my master's uh, degree. And, 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 I, and I needed to, after my master's degree, I was so happy to come back from Aplory and I want to watch bed, I want to volunteer, mm. and I need to recruit some youth. But the question they will always ask is, how much will you give us? <laughs> will you just be going to the bush to watch bed? How much? So I love this question. Sir, you can answer that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Actually, it is very, very challenging going out to the bush, you know, traveling, moving from north to south, from south to north. You know, it involves a lot of uh, resources. That is why, from the definition of uh, citizen scientists, there are people that uh, sacrifice their resources and time to map observations. So if you are not buoyant, if you don't have the resources, you can only observe what is just around you. That is the beauty of citizen science. Within your backyard, at school, at our offices, we have some plant and animals around us. So you can just uh, map. So it is uh, very, very easy and simple. If uh, by chance you travel anywhere, you should take the opportunity of biomapping, that is uh, observing na uh, nature. Okay, in addition, I, I have a very good friend of mine who is listening to us, who is a, I think a professional in citizen science. Limbeka, ah. are you listening to us? Do you want us to mute you to say something on citizen science, Limbeka? I think he's not there. He's not there? Mm, I think so. Yeah, I, because I, I read something Jesus sent to us now. But let me quickly respond to this. I've always been telling my, the young one coming up, the young professionals, the youth, that whatever thing you want to do in life, Please don't put money first. 
love exactly. what we do. When you love what we do, money will come. Sure. When I started forestry, I didn't know how forestry can bring in money. I didn't know how forestry, I don't think forestry can make me, can put food on my table. But I love forestry. I do forestry. Along the line that I'm doing forestry, money started coming in. With forestry, I've traveled far and wide. With forestry, I get sponsorship. With forestry, I get scholarship. With forestry, I get grants. So if you love what you do, money will come out. So whatever thing you want to do in citizen science, if you are coming to citizen science, come into it with open mind that let me love this thing that I want to do. You won't know the idea will start flowing on how you can turn it into money. People were using Facebook. A lot of people are using Facebook today. They don't know that Facebook can generate money. A number of people are using <laughs> Sure, people it's true. Their hand. They don't know how it can generate money for them. Now, talk to talk of something you are going to the white. So please, first, open your mind. Love the nature. Love what you observe. And you don't know. The idea will drop onto you, and you can turn it into money. So interest first, money later. Yeah, thank you, sir. I also want to add to that. We also need to change our mindset. We must know that nature is giving us a lot of things. And this is just the way to pay back to nature. So I, I, like, like doctor said, you know, when I just came back from Aplori after my master's, I was just watching bed and doing atlasing without pay. But when I was writing my motivational letter, what actually attracted my supervisor was the atlasing I was doing. She yeah. called and she was like, wow, you've been doing atlasing. That is good. And that was what attracted her. So do anything your hand finds you. Do it with all your might. Especially nature. You need to pay back to nature. So paying back to nature is by giving nature back, plant trees, creating awareness, protecting the little biodiversity around you. Protect them. Like the birds. They help to disperse seed. They help to pollinate. So conserving them really goes a long way. So when you conserve biodiversity, you actually do yourself good. Mm. So let's continue. I think this is the last question. I think so. Yeah, I've seen one you mentioned. But yes, mm. yeah. this, this will be the last question. We, we really apologize. This will be the last question. Most students, I must confess, don't like finding their way into the bush. Talk less of forest. A lot of forestry students, including myself, are finding it very difficult to let our parents, friends, and family know what natural resource really entails. How do we make it attractive to a layman? White collar job as add a permanent place in art of impressioning undergraduates. So how do we make forestry attractive? How do we tell people that forestry is better than white collar job? Going to the bush is better than sitting down in banks and putting on a tie. <laughs> the, the, let me quickly say this one. You cannot change people. You can only change yourself. So whatever profession you are doing, number one, first change yourself to like it, even if you don't like it initially. So if you love forestry, you like forestry, and people see the love and the joy in you, they will like it. Let it flow from you to the outside world. Let it flow in the way you talk about it. Let it flow in the way you reason about it. Let it flow in the way you display it. Then people will like it. Now, when I tell people I'm studying forestry, I'm studying forestry, I've seen a lot of people who now want to come into forestry because of what I tell them, of what are the benefits, because I develop the interest in it first. And then it flows for me outward. So don't let you want to be the one trying to convince people to like what you're doing. But you first convince yourself to like what you're doing. And then from there, it flows out and people will love it. You see a number of people watching bird and they love bird. Doing watching lion. I traveled to Kenya and I saw a lady who is in a forest for months, staying in the forest in tent. She's from the U.S. and she says she's not going home. She loves to be in the forest in Kenya. Why some people are killing themselves to get visa to go to U.S.? That is the love the person develops for those things she's doing in the wild. So if you love what you do, 
that is what I want us, even if you don't remember anything on this word environment, uh, environment day, love what you do, love nature, love mm. environment, and it will turn to money for you later. So. Thank you so mm. much. Thank you so much. So the next uh, agenda, the next thing on our agenda is open deliberation. So I would like to invite, uh, thank you, Mr. Ringim. Thank you so yeah, much. Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so I would like to invite Dr. Fala for the next uh, thing on the agenda, which is open deliberation. Dr. Fala. Yeah, thank you very much once again for moderating this uh, video. Me to Dr. Uh, to Mr. Ringin, who will soon become doctor. We pray. Uh, hey, thank, hey, thank you, you. everybody, and for all our people that have stayed put there that have been observing us. Thank you very much. We don't know if there is in one way or the other you have. Uh, listening to Ross, you have contributed to Ross, is a very lovely thing to be here this evening. And to learn about World Environment Day. It's time that we take turn, it's our turn now to care for the nature. Nature has done its own best in taking care of us. So, without wasting our time, because we have uh, spent a lot of time with the question we have uh, answered, I think we have addressed a lot of issues. But with all mm. what, what just happened today, that gives me the idea that this will not be the end of our webinar. We'll continue to have webinar mm. with our members, with our friends, with our professors, with our even senior colleagues. I've seen a number of a number of our senior colleagues who stay put, who are listening to us. So please let us take care of nature. That is the message we want to uh, dish out this year. Let's take care of nature as nature has already taking care of us. Please let us do that. So I'll quickly move on to Safe Sahara Network. A number of us have been asking questions about Safe Sahara Network. Safe Sahara Network is a non-governmental organization with a board of trustees that we, we have in our agenda, in our vision and mission statement. We are taking care of nature, saving nature, and then we use it in empowering people at the grassroots. So we combine saving nature with empowerment of people, with capacity building with people. So we are on Facebook, as I said, please go to Facebook and join us. You can send me a message on Facebook, I will respond to you. If you give me your number, WhatsApp number, we'll add it to our WhatsApp group. Now we are increasing the video on our YouTube channel. We have a YouTube channel that we are increasing and we are adding video. That this, uh, the webinar of today, after we've downloaded it, we're going to upload it to our YouTube channel too. Please watch out and uh, participate. So don't let me waste most of our time. The slide that we present today, I'm going to seek permission from uh, Mr. Ringim. But the number of people are asking us if we will make available this slide. For my own slide, I'm going to make it available. We'll upload it. We'll send it to email for to as many people that registered for this webinar. We have your emails. We're going to send the PowerPoint to you so that you can go through all what we have presented at your own uh, pace. Now, the recording too, we're going to make it available. And if you want to register for Safe Sahara, uh, network we're going to send the link to your email for as many people that are registered with us we're going to send it to your email you just need to click it fill the form and then you join us uh, so i appreciate you all i just have to appreciate uh, my board member who are already who have been listening to us uh dr mrs bola adelete from all the way from redeemer university I appreciate uh, Dr. Afolayo, uh all the way from Nagrab in Ibadan. I appreciate you enough. I also want to appreciate Mrs. Babalola, one of our trustees too, uh, all the way from Ilorin here. I appreciate you. Uh, Dr. Ainde is unavoidably absent. I appreciate you too. So these are the five board of uh, trustees, including me. I appreciate all of them. I appreciate Dr. Laleru for joining us. She, mm. we met on Society for Conservation Biology. She's one of our strong members, even not. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I appreciate you. I can see you on our list. Well done, ma. Yeah. I appreciate mm -hmm. all our friends because of time that we cannot mention your name. Mm -hmm. I appreciate a number of my friends 
friends and even my students in Nigeria and my students from South Africa. Guadalupe, I saw you there. So I appreciate you all for joining us. This is, will not be the end. As I said, this is not the end of our webinar. I have a number of topics we have lined up already that we will be dishing out. There's something we have uh, very soon, watch out, it's called digital conservation. How we can use different technologies to conserve wild animals. I'm bringing somebody from National Geographic to teach us that. Also, very soon, Save Sahara Network, we want to launch out a book. We are talking about curriculum, curriculum, curriculum. We discovered that most of our curriculum in schools are not that friendly with environment. So Save Sahara Network, we want to produce a book that students in primary and secondary school can read. We are producing the book and we are giving out to them for free a number that we can give out, then we want to do that. But we don't want it to be just some people to sit down and write the book. We want Safe Sahara Network members to be the one that will write these books. So I'm going to send out a call for as many of us that are interested in writing chapters for this book. There will be different topics that I will put together in the call. So for as many of us that are interested, write your chapter, we're going to review it, and we compile those ones we accepted into a very good book that we can give out for our students to be using in their schools. So once again, I appreciate you. For Green School Initiative, some of us are telling or asking us whether you can participate in Green School Initiative. Yes, you can participate, just let me know, please. Drop me messages, send messages to me, ask questions if there's any assistance we can render to you if you get funding from our international donors we're going to give you fund if it is resources like seedlings cutlers hose and everything that you need to make it a success we'll give them to you just let us know when the resources are available we're going to give them to you so on a final note once again i appreciate you all i say thank you for taking your time to listen to us and thank you for the participation. I appreciate Alex Onotunji, who is my program manager, who gave us the opening speech. I appreciate Bidemi, that is my baby in academics, uh, who is now growing enough to be my colleagues. Huh? So stay put in South Africa. I hope you are enjoying the winter. And then I appreciate my yeah. very, I appreciate my very good friend, Mr. Ringi, for taking time. Thank you. To you are welcome. Okay. This, this presentation we had today is less than a week. Most of you will not believe it. We put this thing together within a week and look at how successful it has been. So thank you so much. We we'll see you yeah, very, 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 very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank welcome. you so much. Well done, well done, well done for the lecture. We thank you. Yeah, welcome. <laughs> is that Mrs. Is, is that Dr. Lale or Dr. Akunayon or Dr. Adeleke? No, it's from Fire Streets. Well done. Hey. Oh, I have one of my students there too, Dr. From Free. Arabo man. You are welcome. So, well done, Doctor. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So, thank you. I hand over to you. We're going to please watch out for our next webinar. We're going to reach out to you. Bidemi, take over. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. So, we will we'll send you email for the next webinar. So, I think we are done for today, Doctor. Doctor Fola? Yes, we are done. I think we are done for today. So yeah. you can you can just leave the um the webinar and expect the email for the for the video, the recording and the slides. So step with join Safe Sahara, Sahara Network, register and you can you can also join iNaturalist and other NGOs to to become a citizen science member. So just connect with Dr. Kola for further information. So you can just edit the page. Oh, edit the page. Bye, bye all. all right. Bye. 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 Thank you very much, Doctor Sir. Thank you, Thank you very welcome. much. Get your friendly. I'm going to send email to everybody. Thank you so much. Please respond. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. God bless you, sir.
<laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Yes, Thank you, sir. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. Dr. Musa Dugara. Uh, Dugara, thank you so much.